we're in John chapter 12. And if I had to, most of the time I, I do title messages. If I had to title this message, here's what the title would be. There's way too much in this text to boil it down to a title. And that's the truth. That's the reality of, of what we're going to go into. So let's just start off by reading this and then we'll, we'll get right into the text. So John chapter 12 and we'll look at verse 36, the, the latter part of that verse, and then we'll continue all the way down to verse 43. It says, when Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, he has blinded the eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Let's pray together. Father, I ask You, humbly, but yet with boldness, not in myself, but in You and in Your Word, that it is God-breathed, that Your Spirit speak to our hearts, that He move in a mighty way. Lord, as the wind is blowing through here and the breeze is, is wonderful to have that, we want to feel the mighty wind of Your Spirit move over us now. We want to understand these words. We want to understand them, Lord, not just in an intellectual manner, but in a spiritual sense, because this is a spiritual book. Your word needs to be proclaimed. It needs to be received. We want it to see it bear fruit. And so, Father, we'll yield this time to you. Allow me, Father, to be a conduit. Just work through me to speak to all of our hearts today, Lord. Challenge us. Change us. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So jumping right in, there's really not a whole lot to, to try to, to, to do a, a formal introduction to this. Just get right into it because last week we took a break from the Gospel of John. Last week we were in 2 Corinthians and we talked about strongholds. Well, today we're back being in the Gospel of John. I want to remind us where we have been. And actually our text does that. If you look in verse 36, it says, When Jesus had said these things. Now that takes us back to a couple weeks ago, but look in verse 35. This is what he said. And so we want to remember what was being said. He said, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. That's the context of this. That's the things he said. But here's the most interesting thing. It says, when Jesus had said these things... Just now about light, and the light wasn't going to be there much longer. And while the light is there, you better walk in the light, because if you don't, you're going to be in darkness, you're going to be blind. It says that he hid himself from them. Now you think of that, you may think, well, that's really bizarre. Jesus is, is proclaiming, he's, he's gone into Jerusalem, he's gone down through the triumphal entry, and here he is proclaiming something so monumental, and then he hides himself from them. I think the fact that he hid himself from them was proof in point that what he had just spoken of was going to come to pass. The fact that the light was among them for a little while longer. And very soon, in that sense, the light was going to be gone. Now, he was laying down his life. But I think there's also something in a bigger picture than this may strike home to a lot of us here. Remember this. Remember in the times of Noah. Remember in the building of the ark. There came a point... When the door was closed. We need to remember that. Remember also as God through Moses parted the Red Seas. And the Israelites walked through. There was a time when those seas came back together. And something else to consider too. One of my favorite scriptures from, from Numbers chapter 21. When all of the Israelites who were rebelling against God were bit by, by venomous serpents. And Moses made that bronze serpent. And they stared at it and they were healed. I searched the scriptures and I can't find another time where somebody later beyond that point was bitten by a snake and looked at that bronze serpent and was healed. Now here's the interesting thing. You can go through the scriptures and if you read through the times of, of kings, they worshipped that bronze serpent. 
made sacrifices, and it was Hezekiah who finally destroyed it, calling it nothing more than a bronze serpent, a bronze piece of something. But the point of that is, it wasn't the bronze serpent that held that power, it was God who had that power, and He used that as the instrument, stare at this, exhibit faith, you will be healed. But my point in this, in all of those examples, is there was a time where it ceased. And we need to remember that Jesus is saying, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light. Because that light's going to end. And so Jesus hiding Himself is proving to the people that it's coming to an end. And here's, the, here's where it strikes home with all of us. If God's leading you to do something, and He's illuminating that in your life, whatever that is, respond to it now. Respond to it. If it's the Gospel, whatever it is. If God is leading you in a direction of obedience, here's the danger of this. Here's how this works. It may come at us directly on our hearts. And and when I say heart, please understand what I mean. The core of who you are. I don't mean the physical heart, the organ that beats inside of you. But the core of who you are. God lays something upon the core of who you are. And we feel like a sledgehammer. And we don't respond. Well, the next time we feel that upon our hearts, it may not be the thud of a sledgehammer, but it may be just a simple knock. But if you don't respond then, it eventually may get like this, and eventually to the point where you don't hear it anymore. Do what Jesus said. Walk while you have the light. Because there may be that time where the light is gone, and if the light is gone, then just as Jesus was prophesying here, the one who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. We need to take that to heart and understand. The light hid Himself. If God is leading you to do anything, respond immediately while you have the light. But in our text, we find out Jesus hid Himself, and then verse 37, though He had done many signs, many signs before them, though He had exhibited time and time again that He was the Christ, that He was the Messiah, that He was the Son of God, And that only through Him can we have eternal life. Sign after sign after sign. Though He did that, they still did not believe in Him. In response to seeing these signs and understanding this is showing that Jesus is worthy of our faith, our trust, in full. The response that they gave was that they did not believe in Him. And remember, the Gospel of John is all about belief. All of these things are written to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is the Christ, and by believing in Him we may have life, an eternal life in His name. What we're seeing here is the Jewish people who have rejected their Messiah. Though the light was shining, they did not respond. They're walking in darkness. They are not believing the signs that are laid before Him. And then verse 38, we find out that this is prophecy that's fulfilled. Prophecy that is spoken of, and it specifically is on Isaiah 53, verse 1. The Lord who, has, Lord who has believed what He heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? If you look at the context of that, if you go, and you can turn there if you want to, up to Isaiah chapter 53. Those of you who are familiar with that, we understand that that is in reference to the suffering servant That is in reference to the one who is going to be pierced for our transgressions. So you can understand the depth of understanding this. Let me just read it to you. Verse 13 of Isaiah 52 says, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall He sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of Him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. And then it goes into that text. Who has believed what He has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And then it goes on to describe Jesus and the virgin birth and all of these things. But the sad part is, is as this is prophecy in Isaiah, it was becoming fulfilled in the disbelief of the Jewish people. The fact that, yes, Lord, who has believed what we heard from us? It wasn't the Jewish people as a whole, as a nation. They should have received their Messiah. 
And recognize the fact that all of the promises that were made all through Scriptures, all of those things pointing to the One to come, they fell upon Jesus and crowned Him supremely. And they rejected it. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Think on this for just a moment. The mighty arm of God. Think about that arm. What does the mighty arm of God do? The mighty arm of God can protect. The mighty arm of God can uphold. The mighty arm of God even scatters. But something interesting that also the mighty arm of God does is it draws. Let me go back, and you don't need to turn there, but we covered this a long time ago. In John chapter 6, verse 44, Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. How does he do that? With that mighty arm. That mighty arm that it says here, to whom has the mighty arm of the Lord been revealed? It was being revealed. But what we find in these next two verses, verses 39 and 40, we have a, we have a collision. We have the mighty arm of God meeting human responsibility. And what we get out of it is a tragedy upon tragedy, which is the hardening of a human heart. That's a dangerous thing to harden your heart. That's why I described earlier, if God is leading you in anything toward obedience, don't harden your heart. We can go back, and you don't need to turn there, but I'll just use it as a base reference. I think one of the most tragic displays of a hardened heart is in the book of Exodus with Pharaoh. I went through the plagues, and it's interesting what happens because, I mean, let me just kind of in a nutshell give it to you, at least the first six. After the first plague, it says that Pharaoh did not take it to heart. After the second plague, it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. The third one says that his heart was hardened. The fourth one, after it, it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. The fifth one says that it was already hardened. But you know what happened in the sixth one? It said, the Lord hardened his heart. See, here's the thing. Read what we said. It goes back down, verse 40. It says, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. The hardening of a man's heart is in conjunction with him hardening it and God hardening it. You can go through Romans chapter 1. And Romans chapter 1 is so telling on a culture that rejects Almighty God. It's a downward spiral that takes place. Read it. Especially starting in verse 18. And you, if you've never read that, I think you'll be utterly shocked at how this resembles our current culture. How this resembles our current society. But if you look through that and you go through Romans chapter 1 verses 24 through 28, three times... Three times in that handful of verses, it says, Therefore, God gave them up. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity. Verse 26 says, For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Verse 28, And since they did not see it fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They had already hardened their hearts. And the true calcification of a hardened heart is where God just hands them over. Hands them over to that hardening of a heart. Therefore, God hardens the heart on top of the heart that's already been hardened by them. And here's the reality. The hardest heart and the blindest eyes, I think, that you will ever see in the spiritual sense are those who have heard truth those who have even seen some sliver of light of a value in the gospel and some truth in Jesus Christ and turned from it. Those hearts are so much harder than somebody who has never heard the truth of Jesus Christ. Those eyes are so much more blind than those who have never heard the truth of Jesus and hear it for the first time. You know, it's funny. Oftentimes we hear these words, free will. You hear it a lot. I hear it. It's funny. I hear free will talked about more outside of Christian circles than I ever hear inside Christian circles. But regardless, when anybody mentions free will, what they forget to talk about and acknowledge is that any freedom of the will we have is encaged by a sin nature. Don't forget that. We are tainted with a nature that wants to rebel against God. If you want a lesson on free will, talk to Adam about free will. I'm sure he would love to sit down and talk to you about that. 
Because the freedom of the will to choose God is encased by a heart that's already hard and condemned because it is rejection of Jesus Christ. That's how hard a heart can be. That's how blind an eye can be. That's why verse 39, and I purposely skipped over that, it says, therefore they could not believe. Their eyes were so blinded. Their hearts were so hard. All of this was in rejection because the mighty arm of God had been revealed. The light was there before them. And they chose darkness over all of that. The mighty arm there drawing them to the Savior pushed it off. Didn't want anything to do with it. You must never forget. Anybody who comes to faith in Christ, whether you're 8 years old, whether you're 80 years old, whether you've done it early in life or you've done it on your deathbed, it is a spiritual thing to come to faith in Christ. It's not just some intellectual decision. And I think that's why those verses there in 40 are said in Isaiah. He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn. I see this as a fleshly thing. If naked eyes and an unconverted heart could somehow take some value in Christ and keep the spiritual aspect out of it, would God heal them? He says that He would. Think on this. Remember in the Garden of Eden? Remember what happened after they had sinned and God had to reject them and cast them out of the garden? Why? Because if they had eaten from the fruit of the tree of life... And it's amazing. You can go back to this. I do want to turn there because I find this... this Intriguing. It's not often that you don't hear God complete a thought. But in Genesis chapter 3, look in verse 22. God does not complete a thought. Genesis chapter 3 verse 22 says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. And then it stops. God didn't complete that thought. What would that be like? Man, in a sinful state, if he actually went and grabbed that fruit from the tree of life and ate it, guess what God would grant him? Eternal life. But not in the sense that we know it today as being forgiven. It would be life in a fallen state forever and ever and ever. And that's why God doesn't complete that thought. What would that look like? How horrible. So many in our culture want to want to stay alive. And they spend money and and resources to to stay alive. But staying alive in a sinful state is no life at all. Rather, lay down this life and have eternal life. Eternal life. Eternal. Forever and ever and ever in the presence of God. Than live many years without Him. Think on that. He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. God does heal, but it's not about you just saying, well, that makes sense, I want to do that. Hey, let me get some of that, Jesus. I'll try it out. That's not going to happen. It's a spiritual thing. And never forget the truth that Jesus said to Nicodemus. You must be born again. You don't get around that. Church membership doesn't skirt you around that. Baptism doesn't skirt you around that. You must be born again or you don't enter into the kingdom. Plain and simple. That's our reality. That's the reality for those who are lost. But remember this. As we see the mighty arm of God and that yes, there's a drawing that takes place. No one is seen being dragged into the kingdom of heaven. Nobody. So don't think of Don't think for a moment where somebody's saying, no, I don't want to go. You can't make me go. Understand, the arm that draws is welcomed by faith. That's what takes hold of it. It's what we reach to it for and and fasten ourselves to it with is faith. Faith that truly is a gift from God. It's not of works. Because if it was, you would boast. I would boast. But as man reaches out and takes hold of what grace has extended through faith... That's the reality of the gospel. But not only that, look at the flip side. The most vilest of sinners. We sang that. That was awesome that we sang that. The most vilest of sinners. If he believes, guess what? Something happens in heaven. Luke chapter 15 verse 10. You don't need to turn there. But these are the words of Jesus. 
anybody, the most vilest of sinners, it says there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. One. You know, there's churches where there's big revival services and you're seeing thousands and thousands of people come and you might think, man, heaven is rejoicing. One sinner who repents. One sinner who places their faith in Christ and therefore turns from walking in the direction of godlessness, of foolishness, and walks in the direction of God. Heaven rejoices over one. Doesn't take big numbers. One. And that's the reality. That, that's the truth of the gospel. It's how powerful it is. The angels understand that. That's why they rejoice. Over one. You know... I wonder if we rejoice over stuff like that. What if, what if one person comes to faith in Christ? We may rejoice a little bit, but do you rejoice more if ten do? One person, the angels are rejoicing in heaven before God, praising Him that one sinner, unworthy of eternal life, but worthy of death, has turned to faith in Christ. It's a beautiful thing. But look in verse 41. Isaiah said all these things, said all of these prophecies that were fulfilled in the rejection of the Jewish people of their Messiah. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory, saw the glory of God and spoke of Christ. That's what he's talking about there. But then verse 42, nevertheless, many of the authorities believed in him. Hey, that's great. But... And but is that contrast. But is what, what kind of shows us the other side of the coin. That's not so good. Because they believed in Him, but for fear of the Pharisees. Now these were authorities, these were religious leaders, but for fear of the Pharisees, they would not confess Christ. They would not confess or profess publicly their faith in Jesus Christ. Why? They didn't want to be put out of the synagogue. Synagogue was the center of, of their, their community in so many ways. And to be excommunicated from that, because anybody who is following the way... And it yet hadn't built to that momentum, but they were going to get kicked out. I mean, that's what the Apostle Paul, who was then Saul, that's what he was doing. He had letters to go and kidnap and bring them back to Jerusalem and kick them out of the synagogue because they were following the way. Well, it's sad that nevertheless there were authorities believing in Jesus, but they didn't confess it. And then we come to verse 43. And I want to tell you, I don't know where any of this has hit you, but I was telling Matt earlier... Verse 43 is going to hit you right here in square between the eyes because that's where it hits me. Look at what this verse says. Why didn't they do this? Why didn't they confess Christ? Well, we know they were afraid. They were afraid of the Pharisees. They didn't want to get kicked out of the synagogues, but there's more to that. Verse 43 says, For they loved the glory that comes from man. Wow. Can you hear the air just kind of go... <sighs> goes out of me. Now glory. What is glory? And we've gone through this in the past. I won't rehash this. But in a nutshell, glory is when something is made reference to to define glory. It is making someone known. I'm using it in this context. So think of this. They love the glory that comes from man. They love the fact of the status that they had within the synagogue. They love that more than making God known. That's really what they did. They knew the facts of Jesus. And not just in an intellectual way. I don't believe it was just head knowledge. It says that they believed in Him, and that's in contrast to those who rejected Him. But they didn't confess that. They held it all in, just like we sang that song. They had a candle, and they put a basket over it. They did that because they loved the glory that comes from man. They loved to make themselves known. They loved the stature that they had within the synagogue. They loved that more than the glory that comes from God. The glory that we live to make Him known, not ourselves. I don't know about you, but this is so challenging for me as, as, a, as a pastor to make sure. And man, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing when people are like, oh yeah, hey, you did this and you did that. But I want to tell you, in the back of my mind, the flesh likes to just kind of stroke that a little bit and say, hey, people like you. I struggle with that. And so the struggle is there to make sure that I am not preaching or living because I like the glory that comes from you. 
but the glory that comes from God that He's known. That He's known. And so here's the challenge. Yeah, you may not be preaching, but you're living. You're living a life. If you're a Christian, you are living a life that has been ransomed. A debt has been paid. Blood has been shed on the cross. A resurrection has taken place in Jesus and in you. And so the question is, whose glory are you living for? This has to be so pointed to each one of us. Whose glory? Because here's the truth. Here's the reality. Every single one of us is living for some kind of glory. It's either for ourselves, the glory of man, or the glory that comes from God. It's either for His glory. And we, we throw that around a lot. Oh God, all for your glory. God, all for your glory. What are you saying when, you mean, when you're saying that? What do, you, what do you mean? Here's what you should be meaning. To make you know. God, this was done. Yes, you used me. But it is to make you know. I want people to know you. I want people to see you. I don't want people to see me. Here's the challenge we live in our world. Because our world says, make yourself known. Let the world see you. Be the best you can be. Live this great life now. But we're supposed to lay all that down. Lay it all down. To live for one. To live for the glory that comes from God. This to me, out of all of this text is the most challenging. Let's pray. Let's pray right now and ask God to please challenge us. And we're going to pray. I'm going to lead us in prayer. But then I want just silence because I want you to ask God personally, God, what are you saying to me? God, if there's any way in my life that I'm living for my own glory, reveal that to me now. Because here's the beauty. When He reveals it, he convicts us of it, which means He convinces us of the fact that we're doing it. We confess it. We just agree with Him. Yes, you're right. I'm wrong. And then we repent in His strength and in His power. So I'm going to pray, but then for just a couple moments, I want you silently to just pray to God and ask Him, God, is there anything I'm living for that's not for Your glory? Anything, any way I'm living for my own glory? Father, communicate to us. I believe You already are. I know you have to me in so many ways. God, this is challenging, but here's the beauty of it, God. You don't, you don't save us and then say, okay, good luck. I hope you can make it to the end. Jesus, we are not left as orphans. We have your spirit. And he's inside of us. And yes, we have that pesky sin nature, but we've got the spirit of God inside of us. And yes, there's a war, but we know who wins. And so I pray now that every single one of us would, would be... Fearful enough and bold enough and obedient enough to, to stand before your face right now and ask God, show me anything in my life that I'm living for my own glory and not yours. And then God, give us the strength to turn for the glory of your name that you might be known.